But as long as there is a human being responsible for closing a deal and a human being responsible for purchasing something to help their company, you've got to find a way to be likable. Like people will do business with you if they like you. Conversations are at the heart of everything we do. But how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. Welcome to another episode of B2B EQ, where we discover what is moving deals forward and making relationships happen, the soft skills that are impacting revenue. Today's guest is a good friend of mine. He is highly accomplished in business development and a sales professional with a proven track record of success in building and scaling BDR teams in early stage SaaS companies. He has a strong ability to lead and motivate with high performing teams. And at over 10 years of experience, he has brought his talents to roles at Sendoso and Upkeep. Now, the head of sales development at Cube, my friend, Joe Venuti. Joe, great to have you. Thanks so much, Tim. Great to be here. It's uh, good good to catch up. It is. It's great to catch up. We met a long time ago when you were working with Sendoso, um, had some great time connecting over Dreamforce, and now look at us here. You're out of uh, out of Arizona calling in and love to, to rekindle and, and continue the relationship. Yeah, same here. It's amazing what um, walking a conference floor and having a couple of cocktails together can turn into. Hey, that human connection, <laughs> it still matters in today's world, right? 100%. Even over video. <laughs> so with that perfect segue, I'm going to jump right in. In the world of B2B sales, what is the one soft skill that creates the biggest impact and drives revenue for companies? Yeah, I mean, I think from a leadership perspective, it's it's probably empathy. And I'll explain why. Like yeah. selling, whether you're a full cycle rep or a BDR, like it's a difficult job, especially when you think about the world we live in now, right? This post COVID world, we're still remote. Some companies are hybrid. Um, the economy is difficult to say the least. There's layoffs, a hundred layoffs every day all over LinkedIn. Like yeah. it is a stressful time to sell. And if you are not in tune with that as a people manager, um, you're really missing the boat. Um, understanding that like these frontline sellers, are really stressed out, probably really scared about what the next six months holds. Um, They have all the same pressure and stress that that everybody else does, right? They've got families, they have mortgages, they have bills, they have kids, they have whatever. Um, And there's a lot of uncertainty out there. There's a lot of people really struggling to put up the same numbers that they have in past years. And even if, you know, quotas have been lowered and and the companies are more accepting of, you know, hey, 80% is, is okay because of the economy, there's still less money hitting their bank accounts one way or another, any way you slice it. And if you're not empathetic and sympathetic to like the challenges they're facing, um, they're just coming in and going through the motions. Like you're, you're not going to get any buy-in. They're, they're, they're not going to feel connected to the business or connected to you because you don't have the ability to go sit in a conference room or take them to lunch or grab a beer or any of that, right? Like I can make time for a Zoom call, mm-hmm. but if it's just a check-in, Am I taking time away from production? So like, yeah, skip levels are important, but I've got to limit my interaction, right? There's, there's a frontline manager that they're meeting with every week. They don't need to meet with me every week. They probably don't want to meet with me every week. I can't blame them. And like Slack has become so impersonal. Like, yeah, I can send a pat on the back or a great job, but like it doesn't mean the same as if I was walking across the sales floor, heard somebody set their third meeting of the day or someone's deal just closed. Like, actually giving them a high five when they ring the bell or bang the gong or all the crazy stuff we used to do. Um, like all of that is gone and, and, and like it's probably gone forever at a lot of companies and it makes this job significantly harder. And if you don't find ways to connect with your people on a human to human level, you're really, really going to struggle to get buy-in and you're really, really going to struggle to get them to go the extra mile when you need them to at the end of the, at the end of the month or quarter. Well, I think going the extra mile, we, we look at that and, and it may look different at every company, but you bring up a point. I'm, I'm stressed and burnt out. Gartner says 95% of sellers are stressed and burnt out. Selling over video, keeping somebody engaged on this medium is harder than ever, more stressful, 
more self-doubt. I'm staring at a picture of myself having to present to a little green dot. I mean, so I think there is something there. How does empathy in action? Because we said empathy a lot over the over the you know COVID times when we all first went remote. It was like that makes the difference in our engagement. How are you seeing frontline managers? What are some tactics you've used to kind of put that empathy into action? Yeah, I mean, it comes down to actually caring about the human beings you work with. Um, we we've all probably had many different bosses in our career, mm-hmm. and. For me specifically, some bosses, I have looked forward to my one-on-one. Other bosses, like, I dread it for three hours knowing it's coming up. And like, and, and the difference is, a lot of times, because, like, the numbers are the numbers, right? Like, the, the, you both know where you stand as far as quota goes. So, like, there's no surprises there. But it's the conversation I'd walk into, sit down, barely get a hello, and then instantly, why are you only at 30% of quota anyway, 80% of the, like, through the month? I say, like, you're going to get to that part. Yeah. How about, like, hi, how are you? How was your weekend? Have any plans? Anything cool going on? Like, just, you know, talk to them. Talk to them like they're a person. Like, it's bad enough that they can't talk to the person at the desk next to them next to them anymore. It's bad enough, yeah. like, I guess, like I said earlier, you can't go and grab lunch. So now, like, they get this half an hour a week with you. And if they're stressed and struggling, and the first thing out of your mouth is like beating them over the head with your month is bad. Like you've probably lost their attention. I don't care what you say the next 29 me- minutes of that half an hour, one-on-one that yeah. is their takeaway bottom line. So, you know, I I've really made it a point to start with, you know, how's life, how's things going, what's new, any plans for the weekend? I mean, whatever it is. And the more you do that, the more you get to know your people, the more you, build a genuine bond and you know before you know it like those high level how was your weekend questions turn into hey did your kid win that state championship basketball game last weekend or you were going on this weekend ski trip how was it and because you're forming a genuine connection and mm-hmm. i think like the other side of that is there's nothing wrong and there's no shame in like you opening up to them a little bit right i mean again within reason there's got to be boundaries but some managers will ask you the question because they're supposed to ask you the question. Yeah. And then, you know, the employee will answer and say, Oh, great. Like, what are you up to for the weekend? Eh, not much. Like, give them something, right? Like, like, like you're a human, they're human. Like, forget about the hierarchy. Like, you're not saying anything inappropriate. If you go into a baseball game or your kids play in a sport or whatever, right? Like, like have that conversation. Like, my one-on-ones have gotten significantly better. And what I've figured out is like by opening these, these, these calls, like slowly and easily and having just 15 minutes of banter, then I'll typically to go with like, you know, how's things going at work, right? I'll start that pivot Mm -hmm. and they'll take my talk track for me. Yeah. It's been rough. Like, you know, I'm not where I want to be this month, but here's all the things I'm doing versus me starting it off on that bad note. And now I have to pry it out of them because they're on the defense. Like, I don't want them to be on the defense. I want them to want to do better. I want them to get better. I want their month to be better, their quarter to be better. But if I'm convinced as a leader, it's not a lack of effort. Let's help them arrive at their own solutions versus me just trying to like beat it into them. It's, 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 it's a night and day difference in how they perceive you perceive that conversation and the rest of their day goes. Cause if you have a terrible one-on-one at nine o'clock in the morning, chalk that whole day up to a loss. And there's another day out of the month gone with no production. And I, and I like that you're honing in on this because a lot of what you're saying here is exactly what we coach in a sales call, right? Mm-hmm. A customer wants to be listened and understood. They want to be, you know, empathized with. They want to have a little conversation and know the person. One of the things I hear sellers talking all the time is like, I get on a 30 minute Zoom call. I feel like I have to show up, throw my product at somebody pitch them to death, get into an opportunity. And I almost think when you reverse that, it starts with maybe that manager relationship. Because we all, like you said, we have the numbers. We know the numbers are there. We all know where we're sitting most of the time. There's no real surprises on that. Mm -hmm. But if I go into a meeting with my manager or a skip level and the interaction is, hit your numbers, I don't care. We need to get this done. You need to do more. I can only happen to like my, my hypothesis would be that just goes down the value chain and out to the customer at some point. Absolutely. I think 
if you think back to like when COVID first started, I think you and I actually were, did a podcast together. Uh, yeah. I, I forget which one it was, but it was on like pivoting from regular world to selling in a pandemic. Yeah. And I said on that podcast, and I've said it probably a hundred times since, if anything good came out of COVID and the pivot to like everybody going home for an undetermined amount of time is it reset the entire stage, took away a lot of the automation, and it just had people having human to human conversations because we were all in the same boat. We were all scared. We were all concerned. We were all stuck at home. We None of us knew what the future held. And we all knew we did have to move forward with, with, with work. Mm-hmm. So everybody, every conversation started with, how are you? And it was a genuine, how are you? And if anything good came out of it, like that human to human selling came back and the companies that nailed it, like flourished even yeah. during a very difficult time. And I think like now, like we're past, you know, the, the height of COVID for, you know, at least for now. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, we've got this tough economy and like, and like there's still like some, some lagging issues. But now I think the pressure and the stress is pivoted solely to the employee versus also the prospect. So yeah. as a leader, if you put that same energy into the people that you begged your people to put into prospects 18 months ago, or 24 months ago, whatever it was, um, it, it's, it's just all cyclical. Well, and, and you think, okay, like you said, down economy. So I'm reading all over the place. You have to go up to the CFO for a decision. It's people are not responding. Um, I'm open to discovering and having a conversation and, and products are moving from, you know, here, buy it today to try it out for 90 days or just get on the solution and let's go. It's because that seller's in a pinch. That seller's sitting there going, Joe, I need you to buy this product. You want to buy this product. And, the, and Joe's probably going, yeah, if you keep pushing me, I've already told you I don't have budget or I'm already told right. you we're, we're closed down but that doesn't change the seller's reality. So right. how do we work out of this? Like as a manager, and there's one quote that you said that I loved, it was senior leaders are responsible for steering, but we all row. Tell me a little bit about yeah, that, yeah. kind of how that can impact this whole dynamic. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think the context I said that in, like I was talking about, you know, being part of a team. Mm-hmm. And just because you're the head of the department, and you are the one like charting a course, right? Like I mean, my job is mostly strategy, right? Like I'm not picking up a phone anymore. Like my job is strategy um, that I have, you know, frontline managers that are, that are, you know, accountability. And then I have reps that are execution. Yep. But at the end of the day, we're all in the same boat, right? We all have the same goal. We're all tied to pipeline and revenue. That's all we care about, right? That is yep. why we exist. That's what we're doing. So if I'm under some illusion as a leader that like, that execution part isn't my problem because I'm more of the strategy person. Like I'm off on my own Island. Like I've got to be in the boat. We all have to be rowing to the same conclusion, the same good outcome. Um, you know, I, I think like that was the context that, that I used that in. Um, uh-huh. and, and, and it holds true. Like the team needs to know that like you care about their success as much as you care about your success. And like that success needs to be mutual. Like one of the things that drives me crazy, and like I've mentored a lot of like managers that work that have worked for me on this. It's, Mm -hmm. you know, we have this goal, we have this goal, we have this goal. And then it's, I crushed my number. No, no, no. We had a goal. You all crushed the number, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not only we when it's tough, it's always we. Um, and I think like like a lot of leaders have a different have a different mindset, right? Like spread the burden, spread the burden, spread the burden, take the credit. Yeah. spread the credit too. It's yeah. actually deflect all the credit. Like, deflect, at, yeah. at, like at, at, at my, at my level, at my role, at my position, like I don't feel like I need to wave a flag and pat myself on the back and make sure, Hey, the exec team knows like this was my team. They know who reports to me. Like, I don't need to wave that flag. They know, Yeah. but the individual reps don't and call them out on all hands, you know, recognize them publicly. That goes so far. In a world where no one knows that they're banging a gong 15 times a week. Like, like, you know, all of that's gone away. Outside of the sales and sales development orgs and, and some of the marketing, no one knows who's a top performer or a bottom performer on the BDR team anymore because they're not in the office. They don't see it. They don't hear it. So it's on me to make sure that person knows that, like, they're seen, they're noticed, and they're recognized. And there's, there's a point there where you're taking some of the stress off that seller too, because it's like, you set a strategy, you set a quota or somebody did right above whatever else. 
Now you're putting it on them. But then if you're only taking all the glory when it hits and then you're putting it all back on them when it doesn't, it goes back to those one-on-ones you were talking about. It goes back mm-hmm. to, again, pointing and going, why aren't we hitting that number? Well, why aren't, yeah, we as a whole, like what can I do to help you get to that number? It's changing yeah. that conversation. Absolutely, right? Like there's the team number and I own it. And then there's individual team numbers that the frontline managers own. Yep. And then there's individual numbers that each individual owns. And when we talk about the each individual number, like that's a one-on-one conversation, right? Mm-hmm. Now, again, it takes everybody rowing in the same direction to get the team there. Yep. But let's be realistic. Someone's going to do 120%. Someone's going to do 80%. Somebody might only do 50%, but these two people will do 130. And like as the steerer of the ship, I just need the overachievers to offset the underachievers and then make sure these underachievers are just a blip on the radar. We're coaching them up and we're just, we're just trying to level off at all times. But like the individual who happens to be at 50% doesn't understand that. They don't feel that. Like all they feel is I'm letting myself down. My paycheck's going to be terrible. I hope I'm not going on a pip. I might get fired over this. By the way, I'm not going to make any money. Like that's a lot. And if you don't help them reset, your best person can have two bad weeks that causes one bad month that they never recover for and end up acting in the organization. And like, that's a shame and a failure on management. It's spot on. And I think it also impacts then the customer, right? It impacts that person that they're selling to. It impacts the experience they have. And those deals, those opportunities that were probably valid, real deals, because they didn't come into it in the right mindset. Now those deals are falling off the table. Your pipeline's mm-hmm. affected. And, and the story goes on. So I want to drill out of the management a little bit and go into how important is it for those individual contributors to then show empathy and how does that impact revenue? Yeah, I mean, I think that they can show empathy in a lot of different ways, but being well-educated in their product and, and in the space that they're selling into is where it all starts. If you call me, uh, if I'm your prospect and you call me and you unload, hey, I've got this platform. It does these 500 things awesome. Great. Like, thanks for the call. Like, I'm not interested in the meeting. <laughs> However, if you call me and say, we're talking to a whole bunch of sales development leaders and they're saying right now, like, in this economy, it's harder than ever to generate, you know, meetings via cold email. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm feeling that. If your next sentence is, here's how we've helped X, Y, and Z, especially if the company is similar to me or in my space. All right, like 10 seconds, you've earned the three minutes you wanted from me. Yeah. So now, right? So like empathy there, like they understand what I'm struggling with. They understand what my day looks like. They understand like the thing that keeps me up at night, right? Because that's what they just led with. And now like I'm willing to hear them out. Like you've earned, you, you, you've earned the three minutes that you were hoping to get from me. Um, so I think like, like that's a big part of how, you know, uh, BDR or even an AE, like leading with empathy, like understanding, like, listen, your job's not easy, right? Like I may be a frontline seller. I probably aspire to move into a director or a VP or a C-level role, you know, 10, 12, 20 years down the road. Like they want to be in that seat. Yep. But showing that you understand that like, it's not all sunshine and rainbows up there. Like people think it is, um, I think goes a really, really long way. Um, there's like this, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. I even hear it with my team, right? Just not so much my team at Cube, just over the years, like, like they'll have an idea or they'll have a problem. And they think like, because of my title, like I can just snap my fingers and make a massive change. And <laughs> like, there's so much more to it. Uh-huh. Um, and like, I've actually like said to people, like joking, like, I don't know like how much power you think I have, but like what you're asking me, just so you understand the school, what you're asking me is A, going to cost X amount of money. So I got to go through finance. B, yep. it's going to break these five or six workflows. So I got to make sure that ops and marketing knows. You know, C, it's going to impact this and that and the other thing. So like, as much as I want to sit here and be like, yeah, go for it. I cannot because I'll break 17 other people's processes. So like, you know, understanding there has to be way more alignment at the top. And just because you're a VP or a CMO or a CRO, like you cannot just make a decision in a silo and snap your fingers. Um, and I think like that's one of like the biggest misconceptions that like especially younger tenured frontline sellers or frontline BDRs just don't get. Like you're the VP. Do it if you you can do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> I only wish. <laughs> right. And, and, yeah. Well, yeah, there's so much change management. It's 
the pain to change, the pain to go past that first conversation and actually make a commitment to putting something in and new, I always liken it like to me, you hear the the infomercials of uh, like pharmaceuticals and it says, here, we'll solve all your problems. And then right at the end, it's that fast pace, like, and here's all the yeah. problems and all the challenges you're going to have. Like as, as, as joking as this is, that's kind of like implementing a new solution or making a B2B purchase. It's like, yeah. oh, the promised land's going to be great. Oh, I'm going to have all these internal problems and everything else is going to be painful. Yeah. To make yeah, this exactly. change. <laughs> exactly. It's like, you know, the analogy sometimes because like the problem may seem big to the to the to the seller in the moment, yeah. right? Like I, I equate it to like, I don't know, you stub your toe. It hurts. Yeah. Right. Now I have this magic pill I can give you to fix the stub toe that's going to be like a non-factor in five minutes. <laughs> 50% chance it'll work, 50% chance it'll kill you. Right. <laughs> like, like it, it's the same thing. Like this one workflow is a real pain in the neck for me. Can you fix it? Well, I can, but there's a 50% chance I'm going to crash Salesforce and no one can work for a week. Like, you know, there's a risk and a reward conversation to be had there too. <laughs> well, and, and it makes you think of the shift, like you're talking about empathy and I'm thinking, okay, what's the difference between somebody saying, here's your magic pill, take it, and here's the side effects and you 50-50, or kind of that doctor-patient relationship, right? I'm not going to mm -hmm. tell you about the 20 shots you're going to need to have. I'm not going to tell you about the MRI and all the machines that we're going to have to go through. It's come to me. I help people get better in this way, shape, or form, right? My specialty or whatever it is. Yep. Let's look at the knee. Let's talk about the mm -hmm. knee. What's it impacting? Is it worth going into surgery for or not? Yeah. Yep. And I think all of a sudden when we, when we position ourselves as sellers that way, and that's what you're talking about with that empathy, now we get to have a constructive conversation. Yeah. 100%, right? It's, 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 I know people in your position have this, this, and this pain. But I think like, so, okay, like you've, 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 you've pointed out a pain, right? You, you, you know, mm -hmm. they have this issue, but you have to like diagnose and prescribe before you can put them under the knife, right? So yep. you've got to show them, here's how we're helping other people, right? Like going back to like your emergency room example, right? Mm -hmm. I have a sore wrist. No way, shape, or form is that emergency room doctor giving me surgery that night. Like yeah. maybe an x-ray, maybe maybe a splint, right? So like that's the equivalent of here's how we've done this for other people. Here's the pain that other people have experienced. You know, we'd like to take this precaution, right? The x-ray or MRI, which is probably your demo. Yep. Um, like maybe we'll give you a 90-day trial, right? Here's the brace. See if that fixes it. Yep. Um, and then last resort, like here's why you should buy this. We've proven our value. Yeah. And, and we know we can provide and you're worth going through the pain of, of taking this right. on. But I think there's that empathy is also acknowledging that pain too often. I think as sellers, you, you make a good point, like, Oh, you're the VP. You can just solve this. Mm -hmm. Nobody goes to that VP and says, you know, I understand what you're doing to stick your neck out for this to try and solve this and what it could put for you, for your team, for your company, if you make this decision. Right. Right. And I think like that's what's not, not to like derail the conversation, but I think like that exact fear in the buyer has been part of what's triggered like these massive buying committees, like outside of just enterprise sales. Yeah. Like, fine. You're going to go sell to IBM or Apple, but sure. You're going to have a massive buying committee, but like, these like mid market 500 person accounts, like it used to be like get to the head of the department, maybe talk to one other person, and like boom, they can sign. But now I just think like, you know, money's tight. You said it earlier, CFOs are more involved than in everything. You know, so it's like, it's all these committees, and yeah. you've got to understand how to relate to every individual on the committee and what do they care about? What's important to them? Because what I might say to you is the head of marketing is wildly different than what the CFO cares about, which is different than what procurement cares about, which is different than maybe the CRO is going to pop his head in and he cares about something different. Uh, so you've got to understand like the people that you're talking to and like what resonates to them and like what keeps them up at night and what's going to get them on board. Um, and, you know, it, it's time consuming, right? It's not an easy, like, it's easy for us to sit there and have this conversation, right? Yeah, yeah. understand what all these people do. Understand all the, like it's time consuming, but you want to be a master of your craft you want to become a sales manager and a director and a VP, like 
the people that have made it up the ladder, like that's how they approached it when they carried a bag, right? Like a different time, different selling, right? Some of us were knocking on doors. And I remember a day when I had no email and it was 250 cold calls a day, but like I had to educate myself on the people I was talking to. Um, and it just goes back to what the whole point of this. It's a human to human connection. If I just call you and say, I do these 10 things great, so doesn't everybody else. If I call you and know a little something about you, maybe it's not even work really, right? Maybe I just looked at your LinkedIn and I know where you went to college. I know that you like basketball, whatever it might be. And like, we have that in common, like spend 30 seconds on it. That's true. It's, you're, you're calling out that human part of the strategy that is so often overlooked. It's, we've, we've come to a data-driven sales world where it's how many calls did you make? How many activities happened? But we're not always looking sometimes at the quality or the qualitative measures. Mm -hmm. Will that person take your call again? Will they right. vouch for you or respond? Right. Did you get the ability to earn that next meeting or to have that next conversation? And then we kind of yeah. go, well, where'd that, where'd that deal go off track? I think it's, it's, it's hidden in those meetings. There was a stat that Salesforce put out a long time ago. It was like most churn, most uh, it is not based off of either you did the product or the product didn't do or did do what it said it was going to do. It was more based off of somewhere in that process, there were cues, there were emotions or feelings that were missed. Mm -hmm. And now we're paying for it down the road. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know where the stat came from and everyone's heard it. So it's cliche, but like people buy and do business with people they like, right? Like that's the tale as old as time, right? Yeah. Before there was computers, like you bought from your golfing buddies, right? Like before, you know, <laughs> I mean, but that's how it was. Right. Yeah. And like, I don't care how much technology, how much AI, how much whatever, but as long as there is a human being responsible for closing a deal and a human being responsible for purchasing something to help their company, you've got to find a way to be likable. Like people will do business with you if they like you. Um, and the, you're not going to be really well liked if all you do is like, Hey, it's 50 grand. Hey, it's 20 grand. Hey, we can fix this. We can fix Like it's totally. And like Tim, like you've done this a long time. Like you've had, yeah. you've been on a, a prospect on a million sales calls. The ones that I feel like, Oh geez, I hope we get through this because we're having so much fun. Just BSing at the beginning of the call end up being the best ones. Versus True. the one when, hey, Joe, thanks for taking the call. Like 55, like in-depth questions about my, about my environment. And then like <laughs> I'm this, interrogating. Yeah. That. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, then, yeah and, and, and then this deck, like, okay. And then here's the pricing page. Awesome. So when I took this meeting, I had these three questions. We haven't even come close to them. So like, I'm kind of done now. Yeah. Like, oh, mean, and I, by I, the way, I've got a hard stop in two minutes. So, um, yeah. Do you never... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and it, it, it's funny because like, like there is companies that I've used over and over and over again at every single stop along the way. Mm -hmm. um, and the one that stands out the most, like, and if you have to edit this part out because I'm going to say a company's name, you can, um, is Outreach. I have had like amazing, amazing experiences with first my sellers, right? The first person that ever sold me Outreach was, his, his name's Craig, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. He's since left mm -hmm. the organ. We still talk. Every time I go back to Boston to visit family, we go out and get dinner. Like, wow. I didn't know him before. He was just the rep I get introduced to, but he knew how to build a relationship. And then the CSMs I got, like the, my onboarding specialists, like they were all amazing. And like, here I am, you know, seven, eight years later, every company I've gone to, I have ended up moving to outreach. And then if I already have outreach, like, great, I can't wait to meet my CSM. You yeah. can't say that about every vendor. Like they have, they have nailed they have nailed the ability to be like empathetic and sell to a human and, and everything that we're talking about. Like their CS team has nailed it. Not a lot of companies have, and it's kind of getting worse and worse across the board, not better and better, which is the scary part. Well, and without me even asking, like you just said, this is the impact EQ has on revenue, right? Like right there, that's not maybe one six figure deal. That's probably it's four. over the course of time, multiple six figure mm -hmm. deals. Yeah, all I mean, impacted the, based yeah. on how you felt or how you still feel today. Yep. Yeah, I mean, they have not all been six figure deals, but it's four logos that maybe outreach never had. Yeah, 
So you've got a story before we go too long. There was a story you're telling me about a Ferrari. I want to go back to that. <laughs> so um, talking about human to human connections, I think like, you know, I spent three years at Sendoso. Yep. Um, and I learned a lot about human to human selling because like that's what they do, right? They're a sending platform. Mm -hmm. um, and in the early days, it was really the Wild West. Um, one of our co-founders, like, He's such a funny guy. He's like, we're trying to work this thing out with you. Like, just send whatever you want to anyone. Like, just just fire away. Like, no budget. So one of my BDRs um, reached out to a prospect. And the prospect was kind of sarcastic. Difficult personality, we'll say that. Uh -huh. um, and my BDR is like, well, you know, with our platform, you can send anything, anytime, anywhere. And the guy replies, send me a Ferrari and I'll give you 30 minutes, hung up. <laughs> well, my prospect goes into the platform, finds a remote control Ferrari, finds <laughs> his business address. This is obviously before COVID. Yeah. Ships the guy, the Ferrari, the, the remote control Ferrari with a note saying, you didn't say how big it had to be. Um, <laughs> here's your Ferrari. I'll expect a phone call in 30 minutes. So the next day, the prospect actually called him and he's like, that was hilarious. Like you got me. I haven't taken a cold meeting and I don't know how long, but my whole office yesterday spent the day racing this thing around. Like it, it was hilarious. Like, yeah, we'll talk five months later. They're a customer. Wow. Yeah. That see creativity in that, the motivation, but the freedom also from the manager to say, make it happen. Yeah. Do what you're going to yeah. do, but how cool to have that experience. And that's a story it excites me about the future a little bit because I think we're hitting this tipping point where we all have to do the volume game. There's no doubt that sales to some extent, just like working out or most things, right? The 10,000 hours or whatever we want is a course of numbers. Mm -hmm. But it seems like the scales are starting to tip. It seems like quality, like like the quality, the 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 personal interactions, the the personalization is actually what's starting to break through the noise. Are you seeing that in the market? I think it has to because there's so much noise. Yeah, right. I mean, like, like as much as we're talking about it, it's a tough economy. Like every day, as much as I see there's layoffs, I also see someone in my network. I just started my own company. I yeah. just raised a round of funding. I just did this, I, and that's all great. Like I'm happy for them all, but. Yeah it's cluttering whatever space they're in. And there's so many companies in every single space, which means there's a ton of BDRs doing outreach, a ton of AEs trying to like get you to get on a second call. Like the competition for your time is absolutely insane. And if you're not doing anything different, anything to stand out, you're just another one of the crowd. And like, I don't know, I lead BDR teams. Mm -hmm. And like, I've said this before, I probably don't even open 60% of the email email that I get yeah. because I know what it is. It's cold outreach. I'm in a sequence or a cadence. And I, every morning I wake up and I just check the boxes and delete them all. Don't even open them yeah. um, because there's nothing there. Like, you know, I, I, I literally scroll the names and then I know what's internal and then all the stuff that's not, I just go up the subject lines. Yep. It's all, it's all, you know, Hey, are you interested in, in, in more revenue? Are you interested in more pipe? I, of course I am. Like, don't like, I, I know the old, the old saying, like, just get your prospect to say yes, but of course I'm interested in more pipeline. Like, give me a little more. Yeah. Yeah. Give me something that's unique to me or what actually answers my question or, you know, and I want to hear this story before you finish up a little bit of poker, but maybe they, maybe they send you a little <laughs> poker chip in the mail and say, I'm betting on you big time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I'll give you, I'll, I'll tell you the poker story, but I'll give you a perfect example of what we're talking about. Yep. A couple of years ago, I don't know, five years, four or five years ago, the Bruins. I'm a diehard hockey fan. Okay. Um, now I'm going to get all this Bruins cold outreach. But anyways. Hey, hey not die. a bad deal. <laughs> yeah. Diehard Bruins fan. <laughs> and I had um, one prospect email me before game three of the Stanley Cup. And he said, I'll make you a bet. If the Bruins win, I will send you a $50 gift card to fanatics.com and you can buy a Bruins hat. If the Bruins lose, like you've got to take a demo with me and we're going to show you. And he actually had a really good email around the value prop too. So like yeah. I would have been interested anyways. Um, like, sure, I'll take that bet, right? Bruins lost. I ended up on a demo. He, he sent me the gift <laughs> card anyway. Somebody else, two days after the Bruins had lost game seven, 
yeah. and the wound was still sore. I was not happy. Yeah. I get an email saying, do you think the Bruins could pull it out this year? My blood boiled. Oh, that they person. Already, they, had already lost, they had already lost game seven. I was outright pissed that I, that I actually took the email and forwarded it to my team and literally said, don't be this guy. Yeah. Game seven was two days ago and we lost, you know, um, I, I had a team of like 65 and like just the reply chain around the company was crazy, but like th- there it is. Like, but that, that's the difference. That is yeah. like that. That's it. I mean, the social awareness there is huge. And a lot of that social awareness is not because that individual BDR necessarily, like they probably had great intentions. Mm-hmm. But they put that email into a sequence. That sequence got delayed by two days. And here we are. Yeah. It's 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 wild. So yeah. I think you hit some great points. And, and in the future, I just see it continuing to move down that path of, you know, we can only have so many one-to-one relationships. We can only scale some of these things so far. So we've got to focus on that human connection. But Joe, outside of leading sales teams, you've had a, a very colorful and fun past. And I want to get to some of your past and, and what makes you notorious right here. Um, so tell me a little bit about little Joe, how he got his start. Take me back. Oh, uh, man. Okay. So take um, me to the card room. Yep. <laughs> okay. So before the, before the card room, um, you know, growing up, like I was, I was always a baseball player. Right? I, I, mean, I was going to play in the major leagues. No doubt yeah. in my mind. Um, right. Like my senior year of high school blew out my knee bad, like six surgeries bad. Oof. So ended up going, going to college, took a part-time job for a contract security company, ended up working for them for 11 years i got promoted i don't know a whole bunch of times and really built like a good good career for myself very very young and it was all right time right place it was no skill set i was a terrible people leader i didn't know any better (laughs) however after 11 after 11 years um i was laid off and i didn't know what to do because like i had this like pseudo director role no one was going to make me a vp at 27 or whatever i was um and like the money drop to go back to being a manager was way too big so I, i i left the industry and wow. um, the weekend of the layoff, I was playing in a poker tournament with some friends that I ended up winning. Um, then, like, I realized this is more of like a league than just a random tournament. So I played again and I won. I played a long story short, they do like these six month seasons. Um, so I played in a whole bunch of them and I made like decent money. Yeah. And then I made like their season championship, ended up finishing like third overall. And then before I knew it, I decided. I don't need a real job. I'm just going to play poker. Wow. Uh, my parents, huge fans of that decision. Let me tell you that, 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 <laughs> that conversation went over, went over well at Sunday dinner. Um, but the truth is for the next two years, that is what I did. I wow. didn't have a real job. I played poker. I traveled all over the place. Um, I was living in Boston two, three times a week, driving to Foxwoods or Mohegan and flying to Vegas, flying all over the place. And then one morning I woke up and um, all of the internet website, all the internet poker website had been shut down. And I thought, okay, this is probably this is probably my, my my red flag uh-huh. that um, I should go find a real job. So I did. That's when I found my appointment only, went in there as a sales rep, got promoted to manager, and then they brought me out to Arizona as another as another promotion. And here we are. I don't know, a wife, three kids, a dog, a turtle, and eight years later. I, I love it. But <laughs> take me to, you know, one of those things, I always think of poker, there's an innate ability It's not the cards you have in the hand, they always say, right? Rounders, but how you read the room. Would you say that that is kind of that innate ability that both goes into your poker playing, but maybe also in your success as a seller? Yeah, um, I think so. And I also think that like there's there's other things. I actually wrote like a LinkedIn post about this not not too long ago. But um, like just your ability to calculate like like, uh, if you don't anything about poker, like Uh hot odds right like how much can you potentially extract from this hand and like that decision to put more chips in the pot or not doesn't necessarily depend on what's happening at this split second it's what could happen in the future right what cards help you if there are two more cards right what what helps you what hurts you if this person you know if i call this hundred dollar bet and then they bet 500 on, on the on the next card like, do I want to commit another 500? So I think it really taught me to like slow down and think about big picture versus like 
I can't just plug every hole with the band aid because I'm going to run out of band aids. Right? Yeah. If I'm just like, if I'm calling a bunch of small bets and don't really have strong hands, I'm going to run out of chips. Same thing, you know, with work life. If I'm just like, quickest way to stop the bleeding is to plug this hole. Well, another hole is going to open up. And, and so, like, a lot of that I think is correlated back and forth. Um, I think, like, the ability to just read people, the ability, you said, like, read the room. Yeah. Um, like people's tendencies. Like there's just, there's a, there's a lot of psychology in poker. There's a lot of psychology in selling. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about what you're doing at cube. Give me a, give me a lowdown of kind of your teams and, and what you, what you're working on there. Yeah. So cube's been a blast. It's been uh, about six months. So, um, in some ways I'm, a, I'm a newbie and in other ways, uh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a grizzled veteran. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I am, uh, I'm, I'm heading up the sales development org. Um, Right now, there's there's an inbound, there's a smaller inbound team, and then a larger outbound team. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we took a B round last year, and you know, this year yeah. is all about execution and scale. So, you know, we're selling into finance teams. We've talked about CFOs being part of buying cycles. So, I think an advantage is like we are going right to the CFO. That's that's the person we need regardless. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's been an amazing company, and it, it's got an interesting story. You know, our, our founder Christina, she's a uh, she's a three time CFO. So wow. she's used every FP&A platform out there, every budgeting software, and like none of them like could do everything that she needed it to do. And like human element of hers, others must have this problem too. Let me be the one to fix it. And that's exactly what Cube solves for. Um, so yeah, it's it's been it's been an, an amazing six months. It's been a very busy six months. Um, lots of hiring, lots of process, lots of rebuilding. Um, and we have a long way to go still, but uh, I'm, I'm loving the ride. I'm excited for you and excited to see where it goes, Joe. So outside of work, what are some of the things you love to do when you're not in the poker room? Are you still playing, by the way? I'm curious. <laughs> yeah, actually, um, I do still play. Um, okay. I've somehow convinced my wife that it, it's a good idea for me to play once a week. Um, hey, you got to have a little I, fun, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I had a couple of winning sessions, so... Um, that helps, right? When you go home and like, hey, look, I was gone for four hours and, you know, made a pretty good chunk of money here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I, mean, I, 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 I play, I don't know, probably a couple times a month. Uh, we said once a week, but it, it's probably like a couple times a month. Just nice. at a small casino near my house. Um, but yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, I have three young daughters. Um, yeah, I mean, real young. I get started late. So they're six, two and a half and one. So the house is chaos. Um, there is actually a dog and a turtle, which I think I referenced earlier as well. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of my time is really just doing the family thing, hanging out with my kids, um, you know, uh, travel when I can. Uh, and, you know, work keeps me busy, too. So try to get a little golf in here and there and always try to get back to Boston to see my family. So that's, that's where I'm from. So we got a nice. two week family trip coming up where I'll, I'll work from Boston for a couple of weeks and spend Easter with the family. So it's busy, but uh, but it's all good. That's tremendous. Well, and one of the things I got to say is you are also, and you didn't say this, but Lauren Bailey is a good friend of both of ours and you are a mentor yes. at Girls Club. I got to give a big shout out to that organization and all yeah. the work you're doing there. Yeah, I just, actually, I just got my email, um, Generation 5 coming up. So uh, I'll, I'll be another mentor. Can't wait to meet my protege. Uh, I mean, I know we're running out of time, but like Lauren and I are both from Arizona. And yep. we've kind of crossed paths a million times and finally ended up like literally the day before everything closed for COVID. We went to an event and we landed next to each other at this executive dinner and we got to talking and I was like, you know, I've been dying to meet you. Like you're doing so many great things. And I told her the story about how I had at that time, a leadership team of five, right? I had five managers and they were all females. And she's like, how the heck did that happen? So I tell her the whole story and she's like, you've got to come speak to, to, to my, my group, my, my cohort. You've, you've, you've got to tell them this story because they all aspire to be leaders. I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do that. So I built a presentation and gave this presentation to a couple of hundred young, young women, you know, young sales mm -hmm. professionals. And like, it was amazing. The feedback was awesome. They were so engaged. Um, and like, I emailed Laura right after this. I'm like, how do I become like a mentor? Like when you, when your next season starts, like, how do I actually become like a one-on-one -on -one mentor? And she's like, you just did, you're in. So yeah, this, will be, my, this will be my third go around coming up. Uh, it's a blast. It's awesome. If there's any young woman listening, like definitely look into it. Like it is a career changer for you. That's great to hear. And Joe, when they are looking at that, where can they also connect with you? Um, LinkedIn's probably best. Um, it's, I'm pretty easy to find there. Um, that's that I, I'm also pretty responsive. So. 
There we go. We'll find Joe on, on LinkedIn. Make sure you connect. Also, check out Girls Club. Um, again, another shout out to Lauren. And I want to just say, Joe, thank you so much for joining us on B2B EQ. Thank you for having me, Tim. Great catching up as always, buddy. Hey, great to have you. And to our audience, thank you for listening to another episode of B2B EQ. And uh, we'll look forward to talking to you next time. Have a good one. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.